Alright, what's up, what's up, what's up everybody, welcome to another hopefully amazing episode of the Bass Guitar Modeling Project, the live Bass Guitar Modeling Project. Uh, very excited to be here with everybody today, I think we made some great progress yesterday, uh, we got to go through and, and model up the frets on this thing, we got to uh, take a look at you know the, the spacing on those frets. Um, we did run into a little bit of an issue yesterday, what I think is a little bit of an issue in the uh, spacing of the frets really not matching up properly with the um, uh, image that we dropped onto this thing. So if we show the master layout component here and we show some of the images that were on there, like the neck only from the top, uh, we can see here that, you know, we, we things weren't quite lining up the way that we had hoped. Um, I took some time last night and really went through and, and measured this and counted the frets and everything. And I think that what this really just comes down to is a distortion in the way that I took the photos. Um, the one thing that I did change about the frets last night with regards to the spacing was I took that first cut that we created for um, the fretboard and 
instead of dimensioning it from the bottom of the nut, which is it says you're supposed to do, I measured it from the center of the nut, and that was just purely based on um, uh, the physical model and taking some measurements off the physical model. So that first dimension that we came up with from the fret calculator was supposed to be 1.796, and that first dimension seems like it's a little bit more uh, consistent coming from the center of the nut than down to this fret. Now, you know, speaking just practically, the way that you play a guitar or the way that you play a bass is, you know, you, you don't you don't put your finger right here, you uh, right here on the fret. You put your finger in front of the fret. So, like, I mean, I call that in front of the fret. You might call it right behind the fret, depending on how you're talking about it. But um, I think that, you know, the, the, the location of that first, that, that calculation that we're talking about is probably has a lot to do with uh, sonic vibration and um, measuring it from the nut to the fret. Like, what does that actually mean? Are you measuring it to the front of the fret? Are you measuring it to the back of the fret? Are you measuring it to the center of the fret? Uh, I don't know the answer, uh, but what I do know is that I went through that fret calculator and measured everything that was, you know, every single fret all the way down along the neck, and they all matched up. Uh, so, you know, the image being in inconsistent with the, those fret locations, I think we just have to chalk that up to the image being distorted. In other words, I took it at a slight angle. You know, you can see here at the beginning, they're almost perfectly lined up and then they get off. But then when we get down to the bottom, they get perfectly lined up again. So, you know, I think that that, that also kind of confirms that our uh, image is probably just slightly distorted. And that's why we are getting uh, the, the difference there. I've done this technique before with the ukulele, which is a, a much smaller scale, and didn't have that issue with the image being so far off. But you know, I'm just gonna say we're good. Uh, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sweat it too much because we are working from images, and the the component itself has a very uh, a very large aspect ratio. So you know, meaning it's very long in one direction and very short in the other two directions. So that's gonna be more prone to distortion when you're taking photos anyway. I'm not, like I said, I'm not too worried about it. BJH says, hey, mind if I come in? Barry, you are always welcome here. Tamborora Station says, it's cold here. Negative 45, <laughs> my goodness. Well, it's a lot colder than it is here, but it's definitely dropping like crazy. And we're getting some currently rain sleet, uh, probably turning into snow. Raj is here, says, hi, Toby. Hi, Raj, how you doing? Emerge, confirming that I am still streaming. Thank you, one of my computers. My monitoring computer, which is over here, uh, just kind of like uh, glitched out and is uh, now only jumping on my wireless and not jumping on the hard line anymore. So I have to double check my switches and make sure they didn't just like burn out. Uh, Richard Hill is here. All right. Hi, enjoy this. Pray for the grid. Yes, indeed. Keep the grid up. Let's keep the grid up. That's what's important. All right, cool. Well, um, I think that that's, that's a good start. We can jump right into it here. Uh, we, you know, like I said, we made some good progress yesterday. So what, what do we want to accomplish today? Well, there's two main things that I want to accomplish today. Uh, the first thing I want to accomplish is I want to model up the nut of this thing. So the nut is this part right here. So right at the very top of the, the fretboard, there's a little piece of hard, um, it's like a nylon or a plastic that goes across there uh, that the strings rest in. So I want to model that up. You can actually see here even in the... the um, camera view that the different strings kind of rest at different heights along that nut so we're gonna we're gonna draw that in as well and we'll draw in what the, the profile of the nut looks like from the side and uh, then we are going to create the inlays so all these inlays here I think this will be fun to do we'll do a what's called a pattern driven pattern so we'll create a, a point driven sketch pattern or a point driven pattern sketch driven point pattern uh, of the the cut extrudes for all these holes that go all the way down the neck and also down the side of the fretboard here as well there's holes that go down the side of the fretboard as well and then when we go into the assembly we'll make one of these little pucks uh, I'm just going to make them all the same size on some guitars they are different sizes but for this guitar they're all going to be the same size uh, so I'm going to make them all the same size and then when we go into the assembly we can just drop in one of these little pucks it'll be it'll look like a little miniature hockey puck uh, in this kind of pearl uh, pearl color and we'll we'll drop in one of those pucks up at the very top here and then we'll just say follow the same pattern that we created at the part level and uh, you know drop at the feature level and drop in the pattern of those parts at the assembly level that's called a pattern driven pattern um, and if we get done with both of those tasks I'm gonna start with the body 
Uh, I'm posting a lot of social media content where I'm showing little screenshots of what we've been doing so far. And I think it, it just kind of looks weak that the neck is so well defined that we did you know so much good work on the neck of this thing but then when we look at the body the body is just like blah you know like nothing's going on uh so i want to get a little bit more uh work done on the body because i think that'll look cool and then we'll we'll come back in later on and we'll finish up with the um uh, the headstock and the tuners and the little cover plate, all that other stuff that we talked about. But, you know, I want to I be able to take a screenshot and show some of the contouring that we've got on the body as well. And I want to be able to see the fret inlays along the neck as well. So that's kind of our game plan for today, our goal for today. If you guys have any questions as we're going through this, feel free to put those questions in the chat, and I will do my best to answer those questions. I'm going to pop out uh, this little file explorer side panel here and drop the chat over top of that so that... We're not missing anything on the screen and everything is, is good there in the chat. Let me flip down to my keyboard and mouse cam so you guys can see everything that I'm doing. And let's go. Let's get into it here today. So welcome, everybody. If you're here for the first time, let us know who you are. Let us know where you're from. And let's get into it here today with our game plan, which is to uh, start creating the nut up top uh, and creating the inlays. Oh, I apologize. There is one last thing I wanted to mention. Um, last night, I did do one more feature. So you'll notice here the frets look a lot better than they did yesterday uh, with regards to this section here and this little contouring that we've got here. It looks a lot more like uh, what a luthier might do when they are uh, creating the kind of final contouring of these frets. So how did I get that geometry in place? Well, what I did here was... Um, if you remember from yesterday, we created the neck as a subassembly, and then we created the frets all as one single part. So this this part file looks like this. Ta da! Looks really good, right? And uh, when we created our first variable pattern for the uh, fret tape on the bottom, it was no problem. We were able to rip that down the whole thing and then cut it at the top. But when we created the top part of the fret here, this was all in the stream yesterday, uh, we did a surface offset to get the thickness of that and we did a surface cut, leaving us with this kind of top part of the fret. We deleted those surface bodies and then we went through and we did a chamfer feature and this was a little bit... Uh, I guess I'll call it exorbitant as far as a time, uh, the, a, uh, the amount of time it took. You know, you can see here that we went edge by edge and went all the way down this thing and got all the frets chamfered. And it's fine. You know, it took us like a minute or two to do that. I don't really like doing things like that. I prefer to have things a little more automated. But I figured, you know what, it's all one feature. It's fine. It doesn't take that long. Let's just go for it. But then when we got to uh, the next feature where we went down and we cut cut the frets to match the tapering that's happening on the neck. So you can see here that the frets are getting wider as we go down the neck. It's not a straight line. Uh, if it was a straight line, it would look more like that. But you can see it's not a straight line. It's getting wider as we go down the neck towards the, uh, towards the body. Well, now we've got multiple bodies. And when you've got multiple bodies, you're not going to be able to do a chamfer uh, on those bodies. So what we did yesterday was we, we did a chamfer here, a chamfer here, you know, got it to what we thought was the correct dimension, but then we had to do a second chamfer and then another chamfer and then another chamfer. And then if anything changes, you know, it's going to be a lot of rework to have to go through and pick all of those chamfers end up with, uh, I think there's 20 frets on this model. So you're going to end up having 20 chamfer features to manage. So I really didn't like that. And so what I did was I took the cut extrude that we used to create the taper going down the side of the, uh, the, the bass guitar frets here. And I created a new plane perpendicular to the end point of that cut extrude. And then on that new plane, I created a sketch, which let's get normal two here. So we're now we're looking down, we're looking up on this thing from the bottom, which I started out by matching the, the contour of this edge here. And then I created a little fillet and then I created a chamfer like so. And um, I know I could do this just as an open contour, but just for sake of illustration here. Then I did a cut extrude and I said through all, so here you can see what that cut extrude is going to look like. Boom! Look at that. That gives us that nice contouring on all those frets all in one shot. So that's pretty helpful. Uh, definitely a nice time saver. However, um, and this, as always, there's these learning lessons you get when you run into limitations in SolidWorks or any CAD system. Uh, when I attempted to take that cut extrude and mirror it about the uh, about the right plane, so I went features, mirror, 
and attempted to mirror that across. You'll notice like something interesting happened where the cut extrude didn't land in the pre-select box when I selected it. And so I select it again here for the pre-select box and I say green check mark to move it across. And it says the selected features could not be patterned using a geometry pattern. Uncheck the geometry pattern box. Okay, so let's uncheck that. Now it says invalid feature for patterning. I gotta get a drink of water to read this dialog box because it's so big. So it says invalid feature for patterning. Please recreate the feature using the geometry pattern option or make sure that the feature is only on one single solid body. I probably should have zoomed in before I started reading that, but so great. Now we're in the same spot again where we can only do this on one solid body. So what do we have to do? I mean, it's a weird mirror. I can't really like just mirror that sketch across because it's it's not uh, normal too. you know the, the sketch is on a slight angle because we're tapering up here so what can we do well what we can do is we can delete that cut extrude leave the sketch behind and then take that sketch and instead of extruding that as a cut extrude and trying to mirror it across you can do a yes exactly so uh, five lakhs in the chat he's on it he's been here before he's done this before um, so now you can see here that what I can do is instead of doing that as a cut extrude, I just deleted that vertical edge there and I'm going to do a surfaces extruded surface. Now extruded surface and cut extrude are basically, uh, or boss extrude are basically the same command. You take a 2d profile and you run it along a path, which is perpendicular to the sketch plane. That's what an extrusion looks like. So even if you've never worked with surfaces, you know, don't fret, huh? Pretty good, right? Don't fret. If you've never worked with surfaces, um, it's okay. It's it's all very similar to the functionality that you're used to. And so what I'm saying here is, instead of doing a cut extrude and then mirroring it, do a surface cut, or I'm sorry, do a surface extrude, and then you can take that surface extrude and you can mirror that as a body. So we can go right plane, we can go mirror, we can say we're gonna mirror that as a body, so we mirror the surface as a body, and then we can take that surface body and we can say surfaces cut with surface. This is a pretty cool command that we've got in SolidWorks. So take that entire surface and then cut with that surface and we'll just say all bodies and this is the surface body we're using. And I don't know if that direction is correct. Yes, it is, it is correct. And so you can see here that now all my frets are cut matching that contour and then we can repeat on the other side. So I'm gonna delete all that, uh, all that geometry that I just created, the surface extrude, the mirror, the surface cut, and the absorbed sketch feature. And the reason I'm doing that is because that's exactly what I did yesterday. So I created a surface extrude running down the entire length of the body. I mirrored that surface extrude body. And then I did a surface cut on one side. And then I did a surface cut on the other side. And then I deleted those surface bodies. And the nice thing here is that this allowed me to go into the assembly of the neck and examine and massage that sketch as necessary. So I could go to the surface extrude sketch here and get normal too. So you can see I'm now looking up the neck and I'm looking at those frets. And then I can just edit that sketch if I need to massage that cut. If I don't like the way it looks, if I want it to, you know, maybe what I want to do is I want to come up around with this, um, with this uh, uh, arc a little more and have that arc match the arc of the neck and then come out with that uh, with that fret, you know, make that tangent, or not make a tangent, then come out with that fret. So I didn't do it that way. Uh, I did this not as a line, but as a very large radius arc. Uh, let's see here, the radius here is 10 inches on that arc. And then I ran it tangent into this arc here, which is, you know, basically tangent to uh, the arc of the, uh, the fretboard. And then, of course, the, what the luthier will do is they will come in and further smooth that out uh, and make sure. Really, what you want is you want what you want is you want to be able to run your your hand up and down the the fretboard, and you don't want to end up uh, having an abrasion on your hand. So if this you know, if where these two are coming together is is sharp at all, if there's ever any kind of overhang or anything, you're going to end up uh, with an abrasion and then that's going to either cut your hand or to just be uncomfortable. Um, and that's that's not what you want. You want to be able to quickly run your hand up and down. So, you know, I have files that I use. Like I buy a lot of cheap guitars and fix them up and, and make them play really good. Uh, so I have files that I use to, to go through and help with that process. Um, and there's, uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of tools that you get when you get into... 
uh, either amateur luthier work, which is definitely the, the space that I land in, very much amateur. Uh, but I know my way around a little bit. Uh, or when you get into real you know, professional luthier work. And these frets do sometimes need to come out. You know, you, you have a guitar. Like I mentioned that the, the gray bass, the gray bass that I have back there has a lot of mojo. Um, that's a guitar that like you just pick it up and start playing and you can just write songs and it's just magic. There's just magic that happens. Um, when you have a guitar like that, you don't want to ever sacrifice any parts of it. So sometimes if your frets start to really wear out, you'll end up actually putting in new fret wire. So this wire, I, I know it's hard to see, but you know, we saw it when we modeled it up. It actually is kind of like the shape of a T and it sits down in there and, and it comes off of a um, helical spool. Um, and you can actually lay that wire, you lay that wire in and then with a very gentle hammer, you hammer it in, maybe a little bit of uh, adhesion of some sort, um, but you can lay that in and you can, you can also uh, pull that out. So when the frets start to go bad, uh, which some of the frets on this this guitar actually are a little bit bad. They're not horrible, but when you play a lot, when you're when you're you know gigging every night, you'll you'll wear this metal, um, and then it won't fret correctly. It won't play correctly. So you can go to a professional luthier, and they can pull these frets out, and then put new ones in, um, and then they have to make sure that they're all at the same height. They do what's called a crown job, uh, make sure that all the frets are at the same height, and that everything plays right. You don't get buzzes. You don't have frets that are too high or frets that are too low. That's professional level. That's that's uh, way beyond where I am. There you go. Barry says, this is a whole new world to me. Well, there you go. Now it's a little bit less of a new world. All right, cool. So uh, so that was the one change that I made last night. And like I said, I, I took a lot of time, uh, looked at the fret calculator. I went to a website called stumac.com, which is where professional luthiers hang out. They have a fret calculator on their site. It was uh, calculating the exact same values for the spacing that I was calculating um, that I'm seeing on here and that I'm measuring on here on the physical so I'm just gonna say that this is a uh, an error a distortion in the photograph uh, which is causing the inconsistency between the photograph and our model so with that let's continue on here on our journey let's create the nut in this thing and uh, I'm going to create this nut here in the um, in the master model layout sketch because you know it's, we're just going to be consistent, and we're going to try to try to um, create this geometry as consistently as possible. So, the nut will sit at the same height as the top of the fretboard here. So we can go right plane, begin a sketch, orient our view in the master model layout, and we can start. Whoops, let's use that cool shortcut that we talked about yesterday. Uh, we can start right here and come over, and that's going to be at a distance of, I'm measuring this over, oh, this is kind of cool. You can see it on my mouse cam. You can see me measuring. So this is going to be at a distance of, looks like about 0 0.25, 0 0.24, 0 0.25. Now, um, we have that, that dimension actually in the nut sketch that we created so let's uh, make that dimension driven and then take this point and make it vertical to this point here and then let's take this point and make it pierced to this point here which is the uh the top of the fretboard so that those two are together and looks like that's coming out at 0 0.2 i guess yeah i can maybe you know yeah i guess i can see that here a little bit a little bit more narrow i'm gonna say i measured wrong the first time um, of course, we could adjust that in the master model layout and update that. This line here is not exactly vertical. It's at a slight angle. And then going across the top of the nut, it looks like it's also at an angle. They usually have actually a radius across the top of the nut, a little bit of a radius. So I'm going to do that uh, as well here. So I'm going to make this vertical like so, and then just put a little radius. So you want to remember when you're sketching in SolidWorks, if you come back and touch the endpoint, you can make a tangent arc. But if you come back and touch the endpoint and then come off perpendicular, you can get tangency to the perpendicular, which is kind of cool, kind of a cool little bit of built-in functionality. So we have that kind of tangency to the perpendicular. And then let's give ourselves the uh, height of this nut at point one is going to be looks like 0 0.33 and at point two is going to be closer to about 0 0.26 0 0.33 and to here it's going to be 0 0.26 and then the angle of this line, so I'll just click the line, click the end point of the line, use the magic handle, put in the angle here. I'll make that um, 10 degrees. It's not much of an angle there. 
I think I'm going to just bump this up a little bit higher. This looks, there we go. That looks better. Okay. That gives us the basic geometry for the nut. So I'm going to sketch color this. I'm going to make this um, the same magenta that we used earlier for the nut. And I'll call this one layout nut from side. Now, the reason that uh, it's very beneficial to rename your geometry in, in this case is because up here you've got a filter for the tree. And so if I was now to type in nut, you can see that the tree only shows me items that have the word nut in them. So if I wanted to quickly filter and just see anything that is related to the nut layout geometry or, or quickly filter, see all the pictures, et cetera, et cetera, uh, this allows you to quickly do that if you learn how to leverage that filter up at the top of the tree. Save and return to the neck subassembly. Here's the neck subassembly. We're going to show that master model layout part that we've been working from, and we're going to insert component new part. And this part is going to be called RBG-203-NUT. dash dash So how do, how do we know that that's what it's called? Because right here are all the files that are related to subassembly 2000, which is the neck subassembly. And uh, in those subassemblies, we've got 201, 202. So we just index that right down to 203. Uh, this is just a method of serializing your part. Uh, part files while you are creating a project on the fly. There are many methods to doing this, so you are welcome to use a different method, but uh, this is a method that I use that, that really works out well for me. Okay, so we're going to call that one RBG203NUT and save and click on the front plane and then immediately exit that sketch because we don't want to be sketching on the front plane. We want to be sketching on the right plane in this case. Sometimes you do want to be sketching on the front plane. Some projects Everything you do is from the front plane. I remember uh, when I created the, the Growler model, uh, which was a lot of revolves, everything was on the front plane. Uh, but in this case, uh, most of our stuff actually is not landing on the front plane, so we often have to immediately exit sketch. So here we are on the right plane. Select the chain from the master model, convert entities, S key extrude, and we'll pick this vertex to go up to, and then for direction two, we will go up to vertex as well, and we'll pick this vertex over here. Okay, that looks pretty good. Uh, the nut is the, what we're seeing in the the graphics here, where this line like visibly comes up and over and down, so that the peak of the nut here is looks to be a shorter distance than out here at the ends. That's what we see in the physical model as well. So if we were to, to look at this thing from this angle here, uh, we see the same kind of thing going on here in the physical model. So that's good confirming that what we're seeing in the physical model is the same as what we are seeing in the virtual model. And let's open that part into its own window and start making some changes. Like I said, this is usually a material that's very close to nylon, so I'll just use nylon here. In newer versions of SolidWorks, you can actually search for nylon, which is nice. Um, I'll make it 610 here. Actually, you know what? It doesn't really, actually, I don't know why I'm even taking time to care about this. It really doesn't matter for what we're doing. Whoops, uh, let's switch back to my keyboard, I'm sorry. So, um, so what I did there was I just took that part, opened it up into its own window, and then I went into edit material and went through and found nylon. It's down here in plastics. In the newer versions of SolidWorks, you can, uh, you can search, but in this case, just went down here to nylon. And then I'm going to go over to my appearance tab. And in my appearances, uh, I'm going to go to my plastics and I'll pick uh, just a medium gloss. I know you guys can't see this behind the chat, but I'm just going to pick a medium gloss, kind of like a dark gray. Okay, that looks good. Looks fine. Looks fine for what we're doing here. Okay. So now, uh, now we need to create the remaining geometry of this thing, which is basically just about four slotted holes that are uh, slight slots that are slightly different in depth and slightly different in width. So, you know, I could just start out by laying this out here. Um, I don't need to, to measure it from the, from the get go, but uh, it's basically what we're talking about is having a slotted hole here, a slotted hole here, slightly smaller, a slotted hole here, slightly smaller, a slotted hole here, slightly smaller. And now we can start using our um, caliper here to measure the width of those slots. So we got, put this 
first one. 0 0.125. Of course, I could also just look at the box of strings and get the measurements off of there. But. 0 0.1. Nope, not radius. 0 0.1. I want to be consistent here. 0 0.1. Uh, this one is going to be... Go a little smaller. Zero point eight two. Or sorry, 0 0.082. And... A little smaller here. 0 0.062. And then we get our uh, depth on each of them, which we could probably use the depth gauge here to do that. Okay, zero point zero eight nine. So that's to the to the bottom. And this one is zero point zero six. Eight five, and this one is Get a little narrow for the step This is zero point zero six five, almost the same, and this final one is zero point zero five seven five. Now, you know, again, I'm using the depth gauge here, so I think I'm just going to put a little bit more meat on these uh, because the depth gauge is going to be... I need, I need to account for the tangency uh, at that depth gauge. So, um, like I said, I'm just going to put a little bit more meat on this. Wait, did I go in the wrong direction there? That last one I did. Okay, yeah, the rest of them... It's okay. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, our center to center on each of these. So center to center from the edge of the model is about it's like 0 0.017 or sorry, 0 0.17. And from the edge of the model to here, hopefully it's pretty close to the same. No, it looks like it's a little more narrow on that side. Interesting. 0 0.135 and then our center to center on the strings here this should be pretty consistent 0 0.45 and our center to center on the strings here 0 0.45. again it's a little bit smaller Let's see what it is here from center to center. 0 0.47, that doesn't seem right. That shouldn't be that much different. Yeah, if anything, that one's also 0 0.45. So I'm gonna make this one 0 0.42. Okay. Okay, I think I'm okay with that. It's interesting really that different it really is it really is that different very interesting okay so that's it we got the nut uh s key extrude cut right mouse button through all right mouse button and we will call this one main shape of nut and this will be called string groove cuts and then we got some fillets here on this thing we got a fillet on each edge here and here and that's probably a little smaller yep that looks good and then there's really I mean all these parts have filleting all around I'm not sure how how much I really want to include that um, it'll probably render really good uh, so maybe it is worth it to include it so like this oh, that's interesting oh there we go so these, 
These are filleted all the way through. And then there's probably this. And I could probably just take this face here, right? And this. Just to make it look a little bit more realistic and smooth. And yes, that is what a nut looks like for a bass guitar. Uh, let's save this. Let's do a check-in so that we have a version of this in our uh, project, our PDM project. Check that guy in. Okay. And let's return to our assembly here. And wow, this is looking good. I'm liking this. I'm very much liking this. Cool. Yeah, that's looking more and more like a bass guitar every day. Uh, makes me very happy. So let's go on now and work on the inlays in the fretboard. So if we take a look at this fretboard here, uh, we can see that there's going to be an inlay here. Um, now we did create this plane above the fretboard already, so that's probably a good, as good a place as any to start with this um, this cut. I mean, I guess the other thing we could do is either do it at the very bottom. Um, I can't imagine that it, it goes all the way through. So let me, I'm gonna make a new plane offset from the bottom by like six, let's say 40 thou. Uh, and let's flip that offset so it's going up. Yeah, I like that a little bit more. And then I'm gonna select a face, begin to sketch, orient my view. And I'm going to create a cut extrude here of this circular shape which has a diameter of wow, pretty much a quarter inch 0 0.25 and then it will be located once again I can do this relative to the center of the nut 4.30 relative to the center of the nut. So um, yesterday, uh, after we signed off, I did create a reference to the center of that nut. So 4.30, and then this is gonna be vertical to the origin. And there we go, and that's gonna be an extrude cut, which goes through all. There we go. And that is gonna be called cut for fret inlay. Barry says, are those, are those inlays just decorative or do they serve a purpose? Uh, great question, Barry. Um, they do ser serve a purpose. So they help you figure out where the, uh, they help you figure out where you are in the, in the scale, in the musical scale. So you've got like your uh, one, three, five, like three and five here are really important. Uh, they help you navigate your scales. Uh, seven is also important here. So you got three, five, seven, nine, and then it skips two and it goes to 12 because this is where the octave is, which means that notes that you play here are the same exact uh, tonal value or they're the same tonal note as notes that you play down here open. So from here to here is one full octave, um, but they are one octave higher. So you, when you play a note here, it's an E. And when you let go and play that same string open, it's an E, but it's a lower E. So lower E, higher E. You're off by one octave. And then the pattern continues. So down here at the bottom, it starts out, it goes open, blank, blank, dot, blank, dot. But when you get up to 12, it's, it's we'll call that open again, blank, blank, dot, blank, dot. So they, uh, they are not just decorative. They help you figure out where you are in the musical scale and where your, your fellow musicians are. You can look at their fretboard and you can be like, oh, you're playing a G. Okay. Uh, let me see what I can play to complement that. <clears throat> So great question. They are navigational tools in the streets of music. Okay, so now we are going to use that plane. So this is plane for fret inlay cuts. Um, and then uh, we are going to go to that same plane again, begin a sketch, orient our view, and we're going to create the additional markers. Uh, now, the way that we're going to do that is we're going to create a point-driven sketch pattern. So we can drop in one point here. Uh, that's good. It's, that's what's going to be called our seed point. It's an option, and you have to specify that you're using that option when you go to create the pattern. So um, 
we're going to just continue dropping these in here. So there's your uh, three, five, seven, nine. And then remember, we skip two and then we go to 12. So that's going to have two. And then we skip, you know, skip two again. And then we're going to go uh, three, five, seven. And then there's not one up here for nine because I don't have that extra fret on this particular style of guitar. Uh, for sake of time, I'm going to just kind of eyeball these measurements. I'm not going to sit here and measure every one. I'll, I'll, I will measure every one later uh, tonight. But for sake of time, I'm just going to eyeball these in here um, and you know, and keep moving on with the lesson. So these are going to be horizontal. Um, really, they're going to be symmetric as well. So I could do a vertical line here, pick the origin, hold control, pick this line. This is something I do a lot is work from the tree. So I'll pick the origin from the tree, hold control, pick this line, make that coincident instead of like trying to find it in the graphics area. Then I'll pick all three of these and make them symmetric. And I will measure the distance between them. If I like to. Okay, so that's going to be 10, 1, 1 1.05 between them. This, uh, this was probably made in Japan, so uh, if, if, it, if I wasn't sure, I would, I would maybe consider just saying uh, it's one inch, right? All right, so we're going to say that's going to be at 7.5. Nope, 7.4. And we're going to say this one is at, you know, whatever it is, 10. Perfect. And this one is at... 12.42 okay that's good and these ones are they're a little bit low I'm gonna dial that number back a little bit 15.45 15.5 maybe it is made using english units i don't know i'm gonna just drop these in place where i want them instead of trying to adjust the dimension now oh, the rest of those look good okay and this is going to be at that value and this is going to be at that, that value. Whoops, that was the wrong dimension. I want to be consistent here. Probably could have just done like baseline dimensioning, right? To do this. Uh, let's see. Just for kicks here. Ordinate, horizontal, ordinate, vertical path. Uh, maybe not. Okay, and we got this guy here at that value and finally we got this guy here at that value excellent 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 Hit the green check mark that takes care of that and now we are going to go to the command um features sketch driven pattern so this is our um sketch this is our we'll call this one uh, point sketch for pattern and so now we're going to go to sketch driven pattern and in sketch driven pattern, we're going to say, this is our sketch driven pattern here. Uh, so it picked up that entire sketch, point sketch for pattern. But um, we're going to use the option under reference sketch for selected point. So we're going to say, this is our seed point. So that's an option that you can use um, to omit that seed point from the pattern. And then here under features to pattern, we'll pick the cut extrude. And there we can see in the preview, it all looks good. And we hit the green check mark and look at that we got ourselves a very nice fretboard with all the appropriate fret inlays at least on the top uh, so this is sketch pattern fret inlays i probably should say on top i'll just make the other ones the side inlays so that takes care of uh that first part of our challenge of getting those fret inlays in place now, for the second part of the challenge, we need to do something similar, but running up this side. So I'm going to show the um, the sketch. Let's see here. We don't even have a sketch that's created there, huh? Okay. So we're going to go top plane, begin a sketch, orient the view. This is kind of a cool little trick that you can do uh, when you... Uh, when you're working with SolidWorks and you want to and you want to create a plane that's offset from some existing geometry, we can take that existing geometry. Oh wait, what am I doing here? I have a planar face there, right? Oh, okay. I don't even need to worry about this. Sorry, I'm I'm overthinking. Uh, let's delete that. Let's exit that sketch. Let's just begin a new sketch here. So new sketch. Let's show our point sketch for pattern because we can reference some of that, those locations. And then we are going to create a... 
You know, it'd be really slick would be if I made the height of that point sketch the perfect height. But I really almost did. That's amazing. Um, I'm just going to do that because it's just clever and it will help me. So what I mean is I'm going to put in one of these fret markers here from the side. We have we have fret markers running down the, the side of the neck as well um, because when you're playing... When you're playing, you're you're holding this thing. Let me see if I can get this to view. Wait, guys, let me. You're holding this thing like this. Uh, and you can see these little fret markers running down the side as well. Because when you're holding it looking down, you're not really able to see that. You're able to see this. It helps you. Navigation. Navigation tool on the guitar. So the distance from the fretboard to that little dot is about it's about 70 thou and so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna make the yeah that's good those are about just 10 thou in diameter uh, let's flip back here to our camera so we'll make that uh, zero zero point zero one zero for diameter but right. zero point one zero go hundred thou and then um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna just change the height of that plane that we use to, to define the depth of the fret inlay and we're gonna make that at uh, 50 thou? Well, that'll give me almost what I want. Let's go 55. Okay. Yeah. See, I like that. That way... Will you cheat the position of the bridge to get the 12th fret exactly in the middle of the string length? Question from the Emerge that came in here. Um, no, I won't cheat anything. I mean, it's a 32-inch it's a scale for the... Um, it's a 32 inch scale for the string length. So the 12th fret is going to land at 16 inches. Um, in fact, we can see that here in the variable pattern. So here you can see this is the 12th fret here and it's at 16 inches. So no, I'm not going to cheat. I don't have to cheat anything. I mean, you do that. You're correct. Uh, so, I mean, what you want is you want that 12th fret to be exactly half the string length. That way you get that octave effect. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it gets a little more subtle when you have the different string. When you have the different string thicknesses, uh, it does get a little more subtle. And so that's why on a bridge, you'll see this ability to adjust. So for each string, you can adjust this screw down at the bottom here, and that lets you change the length of the string. So you notice the string length goes up here. Um, and you know, that way you can really get it dialed in using a tuner. So that's the answer. I mean, there it's, it's different. It's really not even, uh, it's really not even correct to have a straight fret. Um, the reality is that when you, if you really get deep into this rabbit hole, you'll find that there's, uh, some people who have what are called fanned frets. So the fret doesn't come across straight. It comes across more like a, a squiggly line. Um, and uh, that's that's their attempt to get perfect intonation all the way up the neck, meaning that the, the notes will sound perfectly in, in tune as you go all the way up the neck. You know, with a piano, you've got the ability to press each individual key. Um, with a guitar, you're, you've got one fret, one line across that fret that, that kind of defines the tone whenever you play on that fret, regardless of what string you're on. And, uh, you know, different strings might need slightly different tweaks. And so what some people have done is they've developed these, like, they're called, uh, not, I'm sorry, I said fanned frets, not fanned frets, but um, I can't even remember what the name of it is. Uh, if somebody in the chat remembers, let me know what it's called when you have the squiggly lines. Fanned frets is another thing that they do also where the frets actually go like this. They don't go perpendicular to the guitar. They, they end up going more like this, and they actually uh, fan 
And that, again, is an effort to account for the fact that the strings are different thicknesses and uh, hopefully achieve better intonation uh, so that the strings have the correct notes all the way up. Um, you know, so, yeah, this is, a, this is quite a rabbit hole that we can go down, uh, but uh, I'm not going to not gonna go too deep into it if I can help it. I do like talking about this kind of stuff, so it is tempting. It is tempting, uh, but I hope that answers your question, Emerja. Okay, so that gave us our uh, cut extrude location for the inlay on the side. So I'm now going to take that and I'm going to go extrude cut, and I'm going to say that's going to go down to, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. 50 thou, let's say. Uh, just so long as the puck is the same distance as that one. And then what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to make that just a smidge smaller. 0 0.090. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another sketch on this surface. And I'm just going to take our dots from the uh, point-driven sketch pattern that we created earlier. And I'm just going to reuse them. Because they're going to be projected pretty much into the correct location. This is a little bit of a cheat, I know. Um, and, you know, if I, if I was making my own guitar, I, I would not be as quick to use this cheat. But... But I'm using it this time, guys. Just because, you know, they're close enough. Fret. No, fret. Okay. So this will be called uh, sketch. I'm oh, sorry. Point sketch. Side pattern. And then I'm going to, this one will be called cut for side. Fret inlay. And then I'm going to uh, take that first cut extrude and once again do a point driven sketch pattern, sketch pattern here. So this is going to be my sketch pattern sketch. This is going to be my initial point, the seed point. And then this is going to be my item to pattern. And you can you can do it without doing that that extra point, but you'll end up getting um, an extra instance of the pattern, I think. Uh, and so that's that's why I do that. All right, that looks good. This will be called sketch pattern side fret inlays. And now we can hide those point sketches. And we can hide this sketch here at the nut. And we can say that this is going to be our um, you know, check it active document. So we have a new version of the neck in the PDM system. And now we can go to our... Uh, overall neck assembly and we can go to insert component new part actually i'm just going to check this in as well just because i like having snapshots at different points of the project it's also cool for kind of like telling the story later on because at any point i can open up one of those earlier versions of the project so now i'm going to go uh, insert component new part and this will be called rgb-305 i'm sorry uh, this will be called 204 and this will be called neck top inlays neck top and I'll pick the front plane of the assembly for that first sketch but that's actually not where I want it so I'll exit the sketch and then I'll go down here to this surface select a face try to think how I really want to do this hold on a second I think I actually want this one to be more of a standalone part. Um, <laughs> I like the emerges says, okay, thanks. That's the kind of rabbit hole <laughs> that act like a block for block hole for my mind. Yeah. yeah, I hear you there, bro. I'm just thinking because my goal is to insert this as a component and then pattern it. I think I actually just want this to be a standalone component. So, um, this inlays top neck, I think I just want this to be, I don't think I actually want to locate it uh, in the context of the assembly. So, I think I'm going to just uh, just kind of do this thing as a, a standalone component. Um, and so, what I mean by that is, let me just take a measurement here. Evaluate, measure uh, from here to here. What's that depth again? 0 0.170, okay. So what I mean by that is I'm going to open this part. I'm going to, 
I didn't really need to make this as an in-context part. I probably should have just made it as a standalone part. So 0 0.250, S key extrude 0 0.170, bring that up to the appropriate height. And then I'm going to rename this uh, main shape, fret inlay top, TGOP, yep, top. I'm gonna have to round the top of this thing off at some point, but I'm not gonna worry about that so much for now. Uh, material, let's make this out of like a, what do we got? Like a marble, a ceramic, that'll probably work. Ceramic porcelain, that's good, that'll work for now. Save, uh, return to the assembly, and then for this part here, I'm going to um, get rid of that uh, inlays top in place mate. I really don't need that. Um, and instead, I'm going to, really, I'm just going to float this thing. So I'm just going to start moving it. Um, assembly, move component. Where is this thing? Here it is. And I'm just going to take it and mate it into place. Uh, so I could use the alt drag smart mate function because this edge here is at the intersection of a plane and a planar face. Planar face and a cylinder, excuse me planar face and a cylinder. This edge here is at the intersection of a cylinder and a planar face. So I can pick that edge, then hold alt, then begin dragging, then let go of alt. And when I get over that other edge, I can let those mate into place together. So that's a, I'll just do that again one more time in case you're not familiar. Begin dragging. Uh, really, you can just begin dragging and then press alt if you want. That's another way that you can do it. And then you hold your mouse over that other edge. There you go. Now you got two mates in one, concentric and coincident, all in one shot. So now all I need to do is just line this up uh, so that the right plane is parallel to the right plane of the assembly. And the reason I'm doing that is because uh, I anticipate adding a little bit of curvature to the top of this at some point. Although it actually looks fine like that. It's such a small amount of curvature. It's probably fine. And let the luthier kind of smooth that over at the end. So um, now we are going to use the command assembly feature. And we're going to use, I'm sorry, the, the command assembly pattern. And we're going to use the option here for... Um, pattern driven component pattern or pattern driven pattern and we're going to say that this is the component that we wish to pattern and this is the driving feature so we're, we're reusing the same pattern that we created at the part level to create the pattern at the assembly level so we just made the feature once here made the, the add the component in here once as a standalone component created the pattern hit the green check mark boom there's all of our fret inlays all the way down that neck. See, this is where we get into a little bit of a sketchy area, right? Because the height changes as we go down the neck. So I'll try to come up with a clever solution for that. Um, the only thing I could really think there would be to maybe just, just do that feature at the neck level. Um, just include it in the neck as multi-body. And that way I can just cut it with that same top surface of the neck very tempting to do that. I'm going to think that over tonight. I, I might make that change tonight um, if I decide that I don't really like the way this is looking. Here I'm going to go over into appearance and try to find an appearance that looks a little better. Probably in like stone. In there's, there's Sometimes there's like marble and stuff in here that we can use. Brick, uh, architectural. There's some marble. Be nice if I could find something that's a little little more pearly later in the presentation we're going to talk about how to um how to create the same. yeah these are all the same i was hoping to get something that had a little more of a a texture to it later in the presentation we're going to talk about how to take photos of other existing components and then use those to skin our models so that might be something we consider doing for this as well all right, so now we can just rinse and repeat with those side inlays. So the side inlays here, um, it's going to be pretty much the same thing. I'm just going to learn from my previous mistake and create a new part in inches here and go <clears throat> right plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, and we'll make this 0 0.09. And then we will bring that out to a depth of, I forget what the depth of that hole was, 0 0.50, I think. There we go and make that out of a material which will be let's see here what do we do before porcelain something ceramic porcelain yeah just trying to get the weight close and then i'll add the same texture of that bone china 
Are there any binding on that guitar neck? What do you mean by binding? You mean like additional inlays? Let me know what you mean, Brad. Two zero. Where's my inlays? Two zero five dash fret inlays side. What happened to my fret inlays top? That's weird. Inlays. Oh, here it is. Neck two zero four. Okay, yeah, yeah. Inlays. Oh, yeah, duh. Inlays side of fretboard. Okay. And save for this one. I think what I'll do is. Um, I'm going to create a. Uh, I'm going to create a mate reference. So I'm going to pick this edge here. S key uh, references. Sorry, reference geometry mate reference. And then I'm just going to use the default mate reference option here. And what that does is it sets me up so that when I go into my assembly and I go to insert that component, I can just hold my cursor over that desired edge and see it just mates into place like it magnetizes itself right into place so that's because i made that mate reference which is also pretty handy oh yeah brad so what brad's asking about here is sometimes uh on the fretboard what they'll have is an additional strip of wood that goes down the side of the the fretboard here to um uh, to hide the edges of the fretboard and it also aesthetically it looks kind of cool I have a base like that my uh, the base that has a maple neck with the the black inlays has that binding down the side It does look really cool. This base does not have that Yes, great question Brad And now this one uh, once again just to make sure that uh, in case I do anything with the curvature Which on this one I'm not going to but just in case I'll take the top plane of this one and the top plane of the assembly and make them parallel and now I am ready to assembly pattern, and this will be pattern driven component pattern. And the component that I'm going to be patterning will be this guy, and then the driving feature will be this guy. And that lets me rip right down the neck. You know what? This one should have been a double, not a single. So I'm going to fix that, and then you guys are going to see this update automatically. So, what I mean is uh, when we look at the side of the neck here. Maybe if we look at it, if I can show it in the right spot. You can see that they all have one dot, one dot, one dot, and then this one has two dots. Whoops, messed that up. That one has two dots. So, this is pretty cool. We're going to fix this. So, you see this has two dots here for the 12th fret, and this has one dot here on the side in my model. So, let's open this up. We're gonna cheat again like we did before. Um, we're gonna take the sketch, the point-driven sketch pattern that we created, and we're gonna take this center point here and make it coincident to this point here so that it's exactly in the center. Whoops, no, sorry, make it horizontal. And then we are going to add the distance here to be the distance of those little fret markers. 0 0.31 and that's going to give us a perfect setup to cheat when we get to this sketch whoops <laughs> okay that was not good uh we don't want that guy to be part of that point driven sketch pattern uh so let's take this and edit feature sometimes they do go up to two octaves uh so you do uh you do have that that capability uh but that's not what we wanted so let's edit that sketch and let's get rid of that point and then we'll just do it with a center line right there boom so anytime there's a point in the pattern it's just like whole wizard anytime there's a point you're going to get an instance and so now we can go to this sketch from the side and we can go to that 12th fret let's show this and then we can get rid of that coincident relationship and move that point over here to this edge and then just add one more point here and just like we saw a moment ago whenever we add a point we get an additional instance so that gives us the two instances of the whole and now we can hide to this and save and close this part. And like magic in the assembly, we can see that now we have two of those inlays instead of one. So it automatically added to uh, the, the design. It automatically added those extra components in the pattern. Anywhere that the original instance had an additional instance, the original pattern had an additional instance, we got an additional instance here. 
Pretty cool stuff, right? I think that's that's very cool. Um, gonna actually check that all into my uh, overall project now, so that we have those additional parts that we're checking in. We have all the updates of all the other parts. We have the the, the snapshot of all those other parts. And I think this thing is looking pretty darn good. I think I'm happy with the neck for now. I think that in our next, you know, next sessions next week or, or next month or next year, right? It's crazy to think. Uh, we will, what we'll do is we'll focus on creating that little cover plate that goes on here. We'll focus on painting this whole thing black up top and we'll focus on adding the machine tuners here on the four sides. But before we break today, I would like to just do a little bit more uh, work on the body of this guitar because I think it is cool. Yeah, it's flipped, Brad. Or sorry, Dave, Dave P. Had a question there about the mouse cam. Yep, I am mousing with my left hand. Nope, right hand. <laughs> and I keep, keep moving the keyboard. I need to get an AI that tracks the angle of the keyboard and then moves the keyboard cam to match it or just mount the keyboard cam right on the, the keyboard so it always moves with it all right so for this one uh we want to let's see where's the picture of the base body only from the top yeah let's show this guy so for this one what we want to do is we want to capture some of this contouring that's going on here uh in the base body Let's bring the base body up here. This thing is pretty cool looking. And let's see what we can do about capturing some of that contouring and uh, including some of that contouring in our design. Uh, it looks almost like this contour up at the top here just comes right up to the very top of the guitar. So we'll see what happens when we get in there and, and start working with that. But I think that's, that's a perfect place to start. So what we could do is we could, from the top plane, begin a sketch and we can create a spline that maybe just starts right here. Um, and then like we talked about when we first created the geometry for the body, we want to try and capture peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. Uh, that's really the trick to using splines over top of your existing designs. So peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. And now we can click on each of these spline handles and begin to drag them into place to manipulate the geometry of the spline using that spline handle, maybe showing our contours uh, on the spline. You know, you can show the, the right mouse button here. You can say, show uh, curvature combs. And if we show the curvature combs here, you can see that we can, we can kind of see when the geometry, the tangency is getting a little bit uh, in conflict or when the, the tangency is looking, you know, looking better, looking cleaner. Um, you want these to be gradient transitions. You don't want anything to be too rigid. And so if you grab this handle here, you can see that that allows us to make that a little bit more of a gradient. We don't want that to be too extreme, too, uh, you know, too abrupt. It's probably a better word. So nice smooth gradient there. If you're done looking at that, that contour, you can just right mouse button and say, don't show the curvature combs anymore. This guy goes like this. And then finally, this guy starts here and goes a little more like this. This one maybe should be more like in this location so I could have it be almost vertical. A little tricky. A little tricky at this this contour right here. All right. I think that's pretty close. Pretty good for what we're trying to accomplish here. So now we can attempt to turn, you know, create that contour. Um, looking at it from the side, it has a similar contour. So I might need to grab a picture, a photo of this from the side as well. Uh, it, it does look like it kind of starts and, and goes down. I think that for now, what I'll do is I'll just kind of eyeball it up for you guys. But uh, I think that I'm going to probably want to take a picture of this thing from the side as well in order to get that, that same kind of contour shape uh, looking at it from the side. Uh, but let's go into our uh, base body here and see if we can't start working that shape into the base body. So if we if we look at this part here, we can look at it um, in the uh, uh, in the assembly in the sub assembly. You can look at it either way. You know, here it is in the assembly. Um, we can show our master model and we can edit this part. So we say, oops, sorry, that was hide, not edit. So we can edit this part. 
And when we go to edit this part, we can say that we want to take that contour that we just uh, captured and we want to um, convert that onto this face. So we can just take that contour there, do a convert entity. That way everything is driven from that original, uh, that original geometry. And now we can attempt to create some kind of a split line or a projected curve in order to remove that material. So this is where things are going to get a little bit tricky uh, because we're going to have to wrap a split line around the model, basically, and have it connect uh, perfectly at this point. Uh, fortunately, it does seem like it's pretty consistent as far as uh, the depth of that cut goes when we get down into this corner here. So I think I'm just going to use that corner as kind of like a staging area to wrap around. And so what I mean is I'm going to start out here on the uh, right plane, begin a sketch, orient my view. And I'm going to start out here with a spline that starts at that same point. And that spline is going to kind of come down where this horn is. And then it's going to come back up a little bit. And then it's going to come back down like so. And then I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have this thing kind of terminate at this location. Now, what we could do to help with that wrap around functionality is we could maybe create a, a horizontal line and then make these two tangent so that it does just kind of like blend right into that horizontal line. But then at that point, what I can do is a uh, features curves projected curve curves projected curve and I can project that geometry onto this face Let's make sure we're going the correct direction there we go so that gave me a projected curve here onto this face um, I ended up with a little bit of extra geometry that I didn't really want uh, because of how that face uh, is all one continuous face so maybe what I would do to help with that element of it is I would just take the um, let's, let's think how we can do this without we don't want to split both faces necessarily Though it might not be that bad to split both faces I'm just kind of thinking here you know sometimes you, you run into these challenges um, we could take the front plane and drag it down like so and then we could, on the front plane, begin a sketch and take a vertical line from this same point here. So a vertical line that has a coincident relationship to this point. And then we could do a split line. So features, curves, split line, and just split it in one direction. And this could be projection onto this face. So that should just split that face here at the top and not at the bottom. Yep, okay, good. That's what I wanted. Now we roll forward to that projected curve, and we want that projected curve to go onto this face. All right, good. Now the projected curve doesn't wrap all the way around. Uh, it stops basically right at this point here. That's interesting. It started curving back down. I think I'm going to need to get this curve here to be exactly at the point of tangency at the peak of that arc. Let's go back here make this happen let's do this edit this sketch and we're gonna make a construction line here which is tangent see this is the nice thing about having these um, having these sketches in different locations on the model uh, you can you don't have to worry about accidentally moving that one layout sketch Okay, there we go. So now that's perfectly connected at that point. That's what we want. And then we can go to our... Why is this error? Made the sketch. It doesn't like something about the sketch. This coincident point doesn't like. Let's try it again. Okay, and then we can go to the... Um, you know, we can make another plane down here. A lot of times I like just having new planes for my projection. It's not really required. It's just it makes it easier for me to navigate the tree later, which is a uh, you know, big plus to me. So then for this one, we could have a coincident here at the end of that curve. Um, and then, you know, we have another horizontal line here. And then we can bring this horizontal line 
back up to that tangency point. This horizontal line really doesn't continue for very long. Um, and so just make it like so. I know there's a gap there, but we're going to do a fit spline. And when we do the fit spline, we'll fill in that gap. So we don't have to worry about it too much. Um, and then it basically just curves up and ends up connecting to this point here at the other side. All right, so now we can exit that sketch and we can uh, features, curves, project it again. And we can project that curve onto this face and this face. And once again, we're having the curve kind of wrap around. Um, they are disconnected this time, so I'm not gonna worry about it as much because now I'm gonna go to 3D sketch. And then I'm gonna use a command called fit spline. So tools, spline tools, fit spline. And we're gonna use a fit spline here to um, connect this geometry and jump the gap to connect to this geometry. So we're picking the entities off of this uh, projected curve that we created. And that goes all the way back up to the top and hit the green check mark. There we go, look at that. That gave us a very nice spline. So that's all one continuous spline. This is all one continuous spline. That should pretty much be the perfect geometry to car carve this thing out. So if now we go to um, surfaces, lofted surface, we can take this and loft it into this. Look at that, that looks real nice, real nice. And then we could do a, um, A lot of times I just, I don't know, I, I just like to do a surface extend if I can. Um, what I'm trying to do with the surface extend is just get the surface to be a little bit bigger. Like I'll make it say 90 thou bigger. So you see how it's just making the surface a little bit bigger all around? Well, that can be helpful when you are attempting to do a cut with surface because it makes it less likely that you're gonna run into a zero thickness error. So see how now the surface is completely sticking out of the body, it's completely cutting through the body. Well, a lot of times that can help you to avoid getting a zero thickness error. Although, I don't really like that. What's this? That's weird. Wow, look at that wrinkle. That's not good. We don't like that too much. Yeah, we don't like that too much at all. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do, um, we're gonna inject a curve to control that loft. So we're gonna make a new plane here. Um, actually, I'm gonna make this from one of the main planes so it's not dependent on anything. So hold control, I'm gonna drag. I'm just gonna drop a new plane in right here. And you can see how this curve is, how this loft is wrinkling and, and you can see exactly where it's wrinkling. So I'm gonna create a new plane there and just add that before the, um, I'm gonna add that in, in line here before the, the loft. And then I'm gonna go back to the loft and I'm gonna say uh, right mouse button at the top of the tree. And I'm gonna say tree display, show flat tree view. So now what, what happens there, if you look at the feature tree over on the left, what happens is right mouse button, tree display, show flat tree view. All these absorbed features got unabsorbed and it's showing me the true solve order of the tree. And so that lets me roll back to before the loft, but still having the, um, the two curves that I'm trying to loft between. So it's this guy and this guy. No, not that guy. This guy. So there's the two curves that I'm trying to loft between and I'm gonna begin a sketch here and I'm just gonna create a spline to, to try to like smooth that out a little bit. So just a two point spline there, hold control, uh, make that pierce, pick this one, hold control, make that pierce. So it's just a, a night, like a, a helper, just a helper spline there. And then what I'm hoping is when I go back into the loft, I can select that as a uh, guide curve. So we'll do guide curve here. See, look at that. The wrinkle is gone. So without the guide curve, yuck. Look at that wrinkle there. With the guide curve, boom. Nice and smooth. Now we can extend surface, maybe. That 
looks a little crazy in the preview. Looks like a lot more than 90 thou. Uh, let's show the solid again and see if we can cut with that solid. So we'll pick that guy, cut with surface. Looks like the direction is correct. Nope, direction was incorrect. <laughs> Flip the side to cut. There we go. And then we'll finish off by deleting that surface body. So you can see here how when you start learning how to use surfaces, the ability to just do one surface at a time can really, really help uh, to simplify the process. Because now instead of, you know, instead of needing to figure out how to do a crazy you know, sweep, loft, whatever, to go around that section and then having it fail because of the wrinkling, that surface was able to be created with the wrinkling, um, and it didn't, you know, it didn't stop us from moving forward. We were able to then to diagnose, like, why isn't this working? We were able to get in there and diagnose that, and then we were able to go through and create the remaining uh, contours that we needed in order to finish up that loft and actually get it to work. In this case, we just injected a guide curve right in the middle. There is another approach that you can use to do that, um, and I did I did just want to mention that real quickly here. It's kind of cool, kind of cool to know about. So if I go back to this uh, surface loft here and then get rid of that guide curve, so now the surface loft is going to have that wrinkle in it again. And let's hide that solid body. And then let's go to uh, tree display, show flat tree view. I'm going to unselect that show flat tree view. The other way that you can do this, it's kind of cool, is you can go to that surface loft and when you right mouse button on it, there's this option in the right mouse button, it's right here above my keyboard view that says add loft section. And what add loft section does is it basically lets you do the same thing that I just did a moment ago. So you could say use selected plane and then pick that plane that we created. And what SolidWorks will do is create an intersection curve at that selected location. So it actually created a new section right in the middle of the loft uh, that we could then maybe modify to uh, uh, to, to uh, smooth out the loft. The problem is that I didn't need a loft section. What I needed was a guide curve. So it wouldn't really work in this particular case, but I just wanted to give it kind of a, an honorable mention um, that that is sometimes an option as well. But in this case, I think that uh, the guide curve solution worked perfect. And, um, and it is a spline, so if I did want there to be a little bit of curvature there, it's kind of like a bonus uh, bit of functionality. I can click on the spline now and then grab the spline handles and just curve them a little bit. And then that way, uh, the final result here is that the loft has a little bit more of a curve to it instead of it just being like a plain Jane flat loft. So it's just a little bit more exciting, a little more uh, exotic in that region. Now it's got a little curvature there as well. So just, you know, just a little bit of a bonus there, uh, but something to think about uh, when you do a two point spline, you give yourself that flexibility to, yeah, make that a little bit more exciting. I think that's pretty darn exciting. All right, so now we can save that. Um, again, I like to check this in along the way just because then I have a snapshot of everything that I did along the way. And Yes, this is starting to actually look like something now. We were able to add that nut up top. That looks great with the nut and with the fret inlays. It really starts to bring this thing together. Now we're able to add some contouring to this. Let's just do uh, one more contour. We'll do the contour that goes down the other side of the base. So the contour that goes down this side. It's going to be very similar to what we just did. Um, so basically just a rinse and repeat. Uh, let's start out here by looking at the, uh, the, the actual master model layout and then from the master model layout we're going to show the picture of the base body only from the top and then we are going to um, begin a sketch on the top plane here oops Let's edit that part and then we'll begin a sketch here from the top on the top plane and we will attempt to like i said just rinse and repeat so we'll make another curve here which is tangent we will create a spline which runs down the side of the body here. This one doesn't even necessarily have to hit hit off at that tangent point. It does hit off at this tangent point down here. Um, we could, you know, we could maybe even say that these curves are tangent uh, to this outer spline here. Let's see if it'll let us do that. Yep. We can make that tangent to that outer spline there. Sometimes SolidWorks will bulk when you do that, and then when you adjust the spline handle, it, it stops bulking. Um, so some different options there. Let's go to this guy here. 
bring this down like so. I'm a little bit uh, on the inside of that tangency point, which is actually what I want in this case. And just using the, the picture here to, to help guide our process. You know, we, we know we're working with a picture, so we know it's not going to be necessarily uh, perfect within five microns or anything, but it'll uh, it'll definitely get us close. It gets us, you know, it gets us off on the right foot, uh, allows us to kind of emulate something that somebody else modeled. Or if you're trying to, you know, do a 3D print to fit something in your house, to fit this, to an existing item in your house, this is a great technique to use. And so now we're going to exit that sketch and we're going to go to the body itself and we're going to do edit part. And we are going to begin a sketch on the top of the body here. And we're just going to take that curve and convert it. There we go. And now we are going to go to the... Um, again, I, I, tonight I'll take some more pictures of this thing so that I, I can uh, drop in pictures on the side here and match the curve from the side. But for now, uh, just to, to keep things moving along here as we're winding down on the end of the stream, I'm going to just kind of eyeball this up. It looks like it follows a similar path, comes down a little bit low in the beginning uh, and then starts to to wrap back up to that other point. So, you know, we can we can draw that in. So it kind of comes down here like so. It gets a little low here. Kind of stays low and then comes back up. Okay, definitely close enough for what we're trying to do. Take this point, hold control, take this point here, make those coincident. Take this point, hold control, take this point here, make those two coincident. And Brad says, surfacing is unlocking crazy shapes for consumer design. Yes, indeed. If you learn how to do surfacing, you can, can save yourself a lot of frustration. You're just giving yourself a whole new set of tools that, you know, work in, in conjunction with solid modeling it's not like you know every now everything i do has to be surfacing no no you're not you're not limiting yourself you're you're expanding your capabilities so okay so this looks kind of like that I, I don't know exactly what it looks like i'll know when i bring in the uh, the photos but now just like we did before we can go features curve projected curve we can take this curve project it onto this face make sure that the reverse direction is selected so it goes in the right direction um Again, this is two different curves. So again, I could uh, resolve. Actually, you know what? I don't even need to do anything. I can just start lofting. So surfaces, lofted surface from this curve to this curve. Let's take a look at what it looks like here. Let's try to cut with that surface just on its own without doing, uh, without extending it just to see what happens. So we'll do cut with surface. That looks like it's cutting in the correct direction. Oh yeah, it just worked that time. We didn't even have to do the... Uh, extend surface and then I like to delete my surface bodies as I'm going through um, usually I actually just batch delete them all at the end but uh, either way that's pretty nice that that just kind of worked no problems on that one this thing is looking great and then of course you know what we'll end up doing is just kind of rounding off this stuff at the end with some fillets uh, we may have to get a little clever with our filleting strategy uh, maybe do like some of those cord fillets, cord base fillets, or, or maybe even like some face fillet action to get that stuff to fill it off properly. So we might do something like this face into this face, see if that works any better. Gonna have to do maybe a little bit of cleanup in that region in order to get this to fill it. It's a little too busy, looks like. Let's see, maybe, maybe I'll have more luck if I do this side first. So he doesn't like it where those three points are coming together. Um... Nice if you go a little smaller, go a little larger, see, you know, see what works, see what doesn't. Um, we may end up having to kind of blast this region here and just fill it in. Uh, this is something that uh, is, is this is something else that's kind of common when you're doing surface surface design. You'll you'll maybe do something like this. where you will um, blast this region out with a split line and then a delete face. And then you'll have more luck with, uh, um, so we'll do curves here, split line, and we're gonna split this and I guess we're gonna need to split this too. Yeah. 
And then we could maybe come in here and do a delete face and blast this stuff out of here. We'll just say delete. We're not going to delete and patch. We're just going to delete for now. Blast. Blast it all out of there. And then we would be able to go in and fill it. Hopefully. Because we're not getting those... Um, we're not running into that issue where the curvature is, is so tight in that region. So now we would be able to fill it there. And we would be able to fill it here. Doesn't want to let me fill it there. That's interesting. I don't know why I'd say smooth edges cannot be filled. Those edges look fine. But anyhow, you kind of see the point of what I'm getting at here is that when we have areas where uh, multiple faces are coming together at one single point, it can be problematic for filleting. And so sometimes what we'll do is we'll go in with surfaces and we'll kind of clean out that region. Really what will probably happen is once I get in and start working with the photos and start cleaning it up with the photos, I'll have more luck. Uh, filleting. I might even choose a different strategy as far as how those different uh, regions are coming together. But overall, I am very happy. Um, I think we did great today. I think this is uh, this is definitely going to work. I mean, the other thing we can always try when you have a fillet that's in a problematic area is you can always try doing it with a, a variable radius fillet. And so we can say here that this is something very small, even zero. So a variable radius with zero. And then we could take this middle section here and say this has got uh, 0.25. And see, look, that worked no problem. So that could certainly be another strategy to, uh, you know, creating fillets in these areas where uh, there's problematic geometry. You could maybe do something like this. This one's got a lot of different edges, huh? And, wow, all the way up to here. <laughs> and maybe this region here as well. And then we could say that this has a radius of zero. And this has a radius of zero. And this has a radius of you know, whatever, 0.25. See if it'll let us do it there too. It's thinking. It's thinking. It's really thinking. <laughs> So with that, I mean, while that's running, um, I think it's probably a good place to stop. I think that overall this thing looks really good. I'm really happy with how this thing looks. I'm going to let it uh, process there for a little bit. But I want to say thank you all for joining me today. I hope you guys are getting a lot out of this series. Remember that in the description of the videos, I've included a, um, a link to the, uh, the photos that I was using throughout the presentation. So when I take this photo from the side, I'll include that too. It looks like it did finish here, but it did not want to create that fillet. That's okay. Um, like I said, I'll, I'll get in there and try and mess with it a little more, see if I can get some better results. Uh, but, uh, yeah, overall, I'm really happy with how this thing is going. And uh, let's save. Let's do a check-in active document. I like this contouring that we've got going on here. Let's go to our uh, overall design here. Let's hide the image layouts, the master layouts that we've got. Look at this thing, man. This thing is looking great. Totally looking great. So we'll keep going. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with my travel for the holidays. So I may be in next week. I may be out next week. Just um, keep an eye on the Too Tall Toby uh, uh, website, tooltalltoby.com slash calendar. And uh, it's it's uh, tooltalltoby.com on the calendar. Uh, on the calendar, I'm creating all the links to all the content that I'm uh, that I'm uploading, not only this month, but next month. So keep an eye on that calendar. That'll definitely help you stay in touch with this. Merry Christmas to all, says Barry. Thank you very much, Barry. Same to you and your family and all of your families out there. And uh, everybody stay safe over the holidays. You know, New Year's can be a little bit tricky if you're out on the road. So just try to stay home, um, especially with the storm coming through. We don't want anybody to, to get any accidents or anything. Um, but uh, overall, you know, enjoy your time with your families. Uh, get out there, give everybody lots of hugs, and and uh, and uh, just spend lots of time with people, interacting with those people, and not with your screens. Put your screens away and just enjoy uh, being live and in person with other humans because uh, it's something that I feel like we we all underappreciate right now. And um, I will see everybody hopefully next week. Uh, I'm still, like I said, I'm I'm doing some traveling. I'm going to be going up north for a little bit, go further into the cold. 
Uh, so I'll be gone a little bit on the road next week. But uh, I will do my best to get at least one more stream in next week. I think we're making great progress on this thing, and I want to just keep going. I just want to work on it nonstop, honestly, all day. Uh, so uh, I'm excited that we're going through this project together. And I'll get those other photos uh, in place and make some subtle adjustments to the body, and I'll review with you guys next time what I did. But I think we got some really good lessons today. I think the lesson on using the uh, feature-driven pattern was good. I think the lesson on creating the, uh, the cut using a surface and then mirroring the surface when your regular features don't work, maybe try doing it with a, a body pattern. Some nice body pattern will work better. That's a good lesson. Um, I think going in and injecting that guide curve into the loft that had the wrinkle, that's another really, really good lesson, really valuable there. Wrapping that, uh, that, that shape around a 90 degree corner, not using wrap, but using something else, that, uh, that's another thing that can be really valuable to learn how to do properly. So uh, overall, I think we got a lot of good lessons out of today's session. I was not showing my screen when I said all that stuff, but you guys just have to imagine what I was talking about. All right, guys. Merry Christmas to everybody. Have a great holiday. I will see everybody hopefully next week. If not, I will see everybody in the new year. Bye-bye, everybody.